Welcome to ProPractice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on one of my favorite works, the Chopin Waltz in A minor, opus 34, number 2. Before we get started in today's tutorial, I'll go ahead and play the first page of this for those of you who are not familiar with it. And since every edition is different, I'll be playing bars 1 through 36 in this edition, which is the Ekier edition. Okay, so gorgeous piece. It's marked lento, so take it for what, what it's worth. Uh, we don't want like a moderato feeling in here, but I do think that you can overdo it. I'm definitely, I think, on the slower side, so this is too slow, though. Uh, a quick note, I remember playing uh, Mozart sonata in F major, second movement in B flat major, uh, the second movement's in B flat major, and then I played it for John Perry, wonderful teacher, and he said, you know, it's lovely the way you're shaping this, but you're playing it so slowly that I'm focusing on the eighth note value. Two and three and four and, um, and that lesson always stuck with me. So anytime I am playing something that's slow, lento in this case, I still want to feel it a one, two, three, one, two, rather than one and two and three and one and two and three and. So we don't want to be going so slow that we start feeling every eighth note. That's just a nice, I think, way to start this tutorial um, with the question of tempo because it's easy to let it drag, but it's also easy to kill the somber, melancholy mood. That's dragging. Or killing the mood. To me, that does not feel lento at all. So somewhere in there, uh, in between there, So there's this bit of hope, and then dejection. Okay, so that would be the first thing that I wanted to discuss uh, in regards to tempo. The other temptation I've seen students fall into is to start to rush the more optimistic sections. Make sure... that wherever you are at in here... that you... We'll go over a few different ways of doing the articulation and the character in those sections um, to help you create variety. This piece has many distinct sections, and I want to point those out. Some people combine different sections because, hey, this is in the same key area, so this should all be the A section. 
Um, I just want to point out the different musical ideas, the bar numbers with them, so you can start to get a general layout of the piece and the structure of the piece. The first section um, is bars 1 through 16. So this is the left hand. This kind of has characteristics of a rondo because we see that come back to other times, but it's not a, a typical rondo form. Um, so I wouldn't call it a, a rondo. Um, the next one is bars uh, 17, or the end of 16, the pickup of 16 into 17, through where we ended, um, bar 30, the end of 36. So this is the next distinct musical idea. Okay, the next distinct musical idea, the reason I'm pointing this all out at the beginning of the tutorial is that so you can organize this in your mind, you'll be able to memorize it much more quickly and you'll be able to recognize themes coming back. And so when you do, you can say, what do I want to have stay the same and what do I want to have uh, different um, in my interpretation or how do I want to play differently in this time around when this section comes back. Okay, the next section, uh, bar 37 through 52. So this is the more jubilant, um, playful character. And by the way, that one is teasing us. The first two were in the key of A minor. A minor, this is the left hand, kind of dreary theme. This one is the right hand, still in A minor though. Here, we get a play on the relative major. This is G7, going to C major. C major turns back to A minor. Okay, so, and right here, a little trick we'll get to. If you can reach a 10th, go for it. It'll make your trill a little easier. Back to C major, back to A minor. And then we get to A major for the next section. So this next section is uh, comprises bars 53 through uh, 84, um, where we see the return of the, the second theme, uh, or the second musical idea that we talked about. Now, don't be tempted in this fourth section here uh, bars 53 through 84, to call bar 69 a new theme. It's So we have this. Okay, and then in bar 69, it goes back to A minor. But same ideas. So I would have that all comprise one section. Then we go back to the second main theme, uh, back in A minor. That's bar 85 all the way through bar 105, where we get the jubilant theme again. Okay, and then this repeats. We go back into this in bar 121. Okay, now bar 152, we see the return of the left hand A minor theme. That goes all the way through 168. And then in 169, we get this surprise. We haven't heard this material. We've been repeating and recycling a lot of the same material up until this point. And then we get this new section of the left hand. And then finally, we think the piece might end. There's been a lot of false endings, potential endings. Um, in 180. 
88. But then he finally, to bring things full circle, goes back to that original left-hand theme. So it's interesting that he starts the piece here and he ends the piece there. It's as if there is this depression or this reality that he cannot escape and Chopin had his fair share of tragedy just read any biography and he faced a lot in his life uh, a lot of heartache a lot of physical ailments um, a lot of hardship so this piece I think um, could be a reflection of what he experienced um, these waltzes this one was um, believed to be written by the Chopin Institute in 1831 um, usually we think of these waltzes being composed between 1834 and 1838. They were published in 1838, but the um, Chopin Institute believes this one was written in 1831. So it's peculiar that, you know, it's written, uh, even though chronologically it uh, doesn't make sense, I think it fits beautifully between that and, sorry, the more... Um, energetic uh, number one and number three. Okay, I know that was probably very confusing with all of the measure numbers, but I wanted to get that structure laid out for you. Again, it doesn't fit a neat little structure that we usually, oft that we can often find um, in formal analysis, but we can see big sections repeating, especially these. That stays holistic, but Chopin does kind of fake us out a little bit with bringing back different A minor themes. So we have this one come back, but then we have this one come back later. Then we have the left hand stuff, and then this one comes back again. So there's a, a quick overview of how the piece is laid out with those measure numbers. I hope that's helpful um, and helps give you some guidance, both with the, the basic structure of the piece and the key areas that we went over, but also with decisions that we're going to talk about with interpretation in this piece and how you might differ them. Because anytime something differs, I like to do a little something different. I don't like a carbon copy repeat. Uh, we don't need to hear a carbon copy repeat. Maybe it's just a slight differentiating of shape or in this section, we're gonna go over a lot of different ideas with pedaling, articulation, even maybe some variation uh, with those trills. So let's go ahead and dive in to uh, the meat of this, how we can interpret this. Also a few technical suggestions throughout, a few fingering suggestions in pertinent places. I won't be going over much fingering because this isn't too um, difficult with fingering. Uh, I would place this more in an intermediate level. Um, of, certainly, this is an advanced piece as well, uh, interpretation-wise. But I do think uh, a later intermediate player could tackle this successfully. Um, so beginning... We see some substitute fingerings. If this is your first time seeing substitute fingering, here's a quick guide on that. So three, two, one to two. So I keep it down, I replace it with two, and I move the one to prepare for this next figure. One, two, three. Or you could do one, two, one to two, however you wanna do that. All I'm doing is I'm replacing the fingers on that half note in order to accommodate the next position of my hand. Okay, let's talk about this. This is kind of the elephant in the room. A lot of students struggle with that. I'm gonna say something that most teachers are gonna hate me for, but the clarity of that trill is less important than the effect of that trill. Of course, we'd love perfect clarity, but I actually think, uh, perfect execution, I should say, because actually I want it to be a little bit blended and um, ambiguous in the sound. Um, so we don't, we don't need that perfect little uh, dry trill in there. So a little trick for you uh, that should help you 
stay down in the keys. And I'm gonna do it up here so you can hear it a little bit easier. So my fingers stay down there and it's just a little blur. And then as it crescendos, I might lift the fingers a little bit more. First of all, that's gonna naturally give you more crescendo before going on to that note. And go right into the D sharp to there. Okay, but you don't need to go solid, loud from the beginning. You want it to be very understated. And a lot of students struggle with this because they get to there and they go, and because a, a left-hand trill is hard for them, they accent it. Stay down in the keys, even if it's a little blurry to begin with and not too clear. The end is what we want to be clear. It's it's like something is emerging out of water. So it's blurry and then... See how... More clear at the end. So as I crescendo, I might lift the fingers just a little bit higher and that will help. How do we execute a left-hand trill? Um, I remember Sergei Babayan actually helped me with this in a piece I'd played for probably almost a decade, the first Chopin Ballade. Um, you know, that was never that clear for me. And he said, you're standing your hand up too, uh, too tall, too upright. He said, if you relax the hand down and allow this to touch the keys in its ergonomically correct, he didn't say that, um, but angle, he said that the, the hand will lie flat. You're not gonna have any tension in this part of the hand. So lie the hand flat. And then as I've taught on this channel many times, the two elements of a trill are wrist rotation and finger action. Students usually don't do any wrist rotation and they do way too much finger action. That's when you get the really loud trill. Sometimes students will overdo their wrist rotation and not have enough finger action. That's when you get a really blurry, inconsistent trill. Like that, you need to coordinate it. So start slowly. By the way, that wrist rotation, incredibly minimal. You probably can't even see it, but it's just, it's just right there, just a tiny little, almost tremor in your wrist. Okay, and in some editions, like the Henley edition has that, and that was in, I believe, the original manuscript. I could be wrong, um, but Ekier has that. I actually like that one better. Um, I believe Chopin had notated it differently in one of his students' editions or several students' editions. I can't remember exactly what I read in my research about that, but it was noted by Chopin. That's not Eck, you're making that up. So uh, just know there is some variation between this because there were so many different editions of this piece. Let's talk about pedaling. Change your pedal. Change your pedal. And notice my right hand is off when I change the pedal. I'm overdoing it so you guys can see it. But this is what's going to give the depression, the melancholy, the breathlessness. And think down, up, down, up more or less, just slightly more. It's not more or less, it's not in your face. It's very slight, more or less. You know, little crescendo, diminuendo. Crescendo. And I like to go all the way to there. There's your half cadence, E7. This one, slight crescendo, but then diminuendo. The reason I do that the first time...